How do you think Hercules looks in this painting? I'm Dr. Davith Mills Daniel, MacDonald Lecturer in Theology at the University of Oxford, and I'm looking at Paolo de Matteis's 18th century painting, The Choice of Hercules. And I must confess that when I first saw this painting, I thought Hercules looked rather bemused, if not even a little bored. But whatever you think about his facial expression, you might have noticed that my question about how Hercules looks is really a question about how he feels. So while King Duncan in Shakespeare's Macbeth might well have insisted there is no art to see the mind's construction in the face, when I look at this painting, I am in fact assuming the opposite. I'm assuming that the artist has constructed Hercules's face in such a way that it reveals the construction of his mind, so that how Hercules looks reveals something about the emotions that he has. Now, fortunately, when it comes to this painting, we have a particularly helpful clue when trying to work out how Hercules feels. And no, the one clue I have in mind is not the painting. It is, in fact, an essay written by the man who commissioned it, Anthony Ashley Cooper, the third Earl of Shaftesbury, better known more simply, if not more modestly, as Lord Shaftesbury. The Shaftesburys were a famous and influential family. The first Earl helped to bring about the Glorious Revolution in 1688, establishing not just a Protestant monarchy, but parliamentary sovereignty in Great Britain. Over a hundred years later, another Shaftesbury, the seventh Earl, was a celebrated public benefactor, in whose honour stands the Statue of Christian Charity, often referred to as the Statue of Eros, that you might have seen at Piccadilly Circus. Our Shaftesbury, the third Earl, was a philosopher, and in 1712 he published the essay A Notion of the Historical Draft or Tablature of the Judgment of Hercules According to Prodicus. Okay, so an essay without the catchiest of titles, but it's of interest to us because it's actually the published version of the instructions that Shaftesbury gave in Venice to the Italian artist Paolo de Matteis when he commissioned the painting. So one thing we know from Shaftesbury's writings is he also thinks there's an art to seeing the mind's construction in the face. Indeed, he argues that when we admire the look on someone's face, we are really admiring what he calls a mysterious kind of shadow of something inward in the temper. The fact that we find certain looks ugly or beautiful because we find the emotions they express ugly or beautiful explains why Shaftesbury combines aesthetics and ethics, the beautiful and the moral. As he puts it, all beauty is truth, but the most natural beauty in the world is honesty and moral truth. Here Shaftesbury is making it the artist's responsibility to create physically beautiful things, to excite in us what he calls a passion of relish for morally beautiful things. And why is it that the artistically beautiful encourages in us this passion of relish for the morally beautiful? Well, because Shaftesbury defines moral and artistic beauty in the same way. There is, he tells us, a power in harmony, proportion and beauty of every kind, which naturally captivates the heart and raises the imagination to something majestic and divine. In other words, Beautiful things and moral things are connected, because whatever is moral and whatever is beautiful will always be harmonious, in order and in proportion. And so that's why artistic beauty enables us to experience the passion of relish for moral beauty. On Shaftesbury's scheme, a poem or a piece of architecture are beautiful when they possess symmetry. In the same way that a song is beautiful, when it is in harmony. And it is the harmony and symmetry of artistic beauty that is able to transport us to an encounter with a still higher and divine symmetry, the beauty and harmony of honesty and virtue, which gives order and purpose to human life itself. So what does all of that have to do with this painting? Well, everything. The painting tells the story of the choice of Hercules a myth derived from the ancient Greek philosopher Prodicus. And in that story, the legendary hero Hercules is visited by two women, personifications of virtue and vice. 
each of whom place Hercules at a crossroads. In choosing between these two figures, he must choose the nature and purpose of his whole life. Will he choose the path of virtue and duty, or the path of vice and sensuality? In commissioning his artist to depict the story, Shaftesbury gave a clear description of what he wanted the figures of virtue and vice to look like. Virtue, he explains, should have one foot raised up, as though she is climbing and advancing. This indicates that although the life of virtue is difficult, it is nevertheless one of action. Over that rocky and thorny ground, you can see depicted in the background on the left of the painting. Vice, meanwhile, you can see on the right-hand side, is the embodiment of inaction. Surrounded by vases and embossed plates to suggest debauchery and amongst silk drapery thrown carelessly around the place, to indicate amorous passions, Shaftesbury recommends to his artist that the only movement of vice should just be the merest motion of the hand supporting the lolling, lazy body. In contrast with these trappings of indolence and indulgent ease, Shaftesbury asks the artist to paint virtue with the sword you can see that she's holding and the helmet that is placed just behind her in the painting. These indicate that virtue has forbearance and endurance. So although that rocky and arduous way of virtue is difficult, it nonetheless ends, as it did for Hercules, in the honour of just glory for heroic action. So what then of that heroic figure, Hercules himself? Well, in effect, the look on his face that I couldn't quite work out is meant to express the relish of passion for virtue growing within him. Shaftesbury wants his artist to imagine that Hercules has already listened to vice and is now listening to virtue. And as he listens, he's experiencing an admiration for virtue taking over him, what Shaftesbury calls a conquering and commanding passion. How can an artist depict such a passion for virtue emerging? Well, by giving him that very look that I was trying to work out. As the passion for virtue is a passion of reason and the mind, rather than of the body and the senses, Shaftesbury suggests it's the sort of passion that can be shown by a movement amongst the more sprightly parts of the body, the eyes and muscles about the mouth and the forehead. In other words, the parts of the body that Shaftesbury thinks are the first to respond to our rational thoughts unlike the lower parts of our body, which are often inclined towards pleasure. Just as you can see in this painting, the rest of Hercules' body is still turned towards vice. In his instructions to the artist Demetes, Shaftesbury also insisted that Hercules be placed in the middle of the painting, because his agony or inward conflict makes the principal action. And we might think that part of the reason for keeping Hercules in the very centre is because it helps to encourage the audience, as we look at the painting, to think about how we feel and what we would do when we are confronted by the same choice as Hercules, between virtue and vice. And there's some sense in that impression. Shaftesbury can lay claim to being the first popular philosopher. Not only did he think that philosophy ought to be about and for the public, he also thought that philosophical ideas are often best conveyed through the arts, through paintings and poems, rather than what he dismisses as dry and pedantic academic books. However, it's also the case that Shaftesbury was criticised for elitism, even in his own day. When he argues about the connections between aesthetics and ethics, he's not saying that the beautiful and the moral are a matter of taste, but rather a matter of having the right taste, the sort of refined taste that comes from a gentlemanly education. So although we can all go now and consider our own and Hercules' emotions by visiting this painting on the public walls of the Ashmolean Museum, in a letter to the 18th century statesman John Summers, for whom Shaftesbury privately commissioned the painting, Shaftesbury expresses his hope that the choice of the heroic Hercules might serve for the entertainment and education of a heroic royal youth. <laughs>